Hi, I'm your host, Becky Davis, filling in for Meg West, who's on assignment. And you're watching GardenWise, Santa Barbara's most informative show about sustainable landscaping. With the current state of the drought, water conservation is more important now than ever. That's why the city has already been implementing ways to conserve water, like shutting off ornamental fountains such as this one at Chase Palm Park. Since water is such a vital resource in Santa Barbara, we wanted to take a closer look at the current state of our supply and find out exactly where our water comes from. Santa Barbara County has a diverse water supply portfolio, including water from Lake Kachuma, local reservoirs, groundwater, and state water. While the county is broken up into two main parts, North County and South County, each district uses a unique blend of sources. Yeah, well, the North County really uh, comes down to groundwater and imported state water. And historically, before the state water project came to Santa Barbara County, the North County was almost entirely relying on groundwater, except for the San Ynez Valley uh, always received a portion of the Kachuma project uh, deliveries as well. When state water project came in, then a lot of the purveyors in North County uh, offset their use of groundwater with state water project. And then when we reach times like this, when state water deliveries are low, they revert back to their groundwater. Everybody has their own supply portfolio. There's uh, Montecito, Santa Barbara, Goleta, Carpinteria, La Cumbra Mutual. Um, they all use Kachuma water, but they have varying amounts of groundwater available. So again, each district does have its own sources. Gibraltar, for example, is only used by the city of Santa Barbara. Jameson only by the Montecito Water District. And they all manage them to varying degrees differently. While North County's supply is made up almost entirely of groundwater and state water, South County is much different. Lake Kachuma makes up 35% of the South Coast's water supply. Kachuma is shared uh, with Carpinteria, Montecito, uh, Goleta, ourselves, uh, the city of Solvang, and San Ynez. So we're all kind of partners in Kachuma. And so that that storage obviously spread over uh, a significant group of people along with environmental needs. There is a significant amount of water in Kachuma that is set aside uh, related to fish releases and downstream users along the San Ynez River. And so when we talk about there being 70,000 acre feet of water uh, in, in Kachuma, it sounds pretty significant when the city's needs are 14,000 acre feet. But when you start to really look at the evaporative losses from the lake, you look at the environmental uh, releases that go on for fish, it starts to get down to that available water for the remaining communities is actually pretty small. It's currently the second lowest it's been since its construction and the only time it was lower is in the drought of 1986 to 91. Um, it's at about 35 percent of capacity right now but even that's misleading because you can't use the remaining water completely. There's um, what's called a dead pool at 12,000 acre feet, and um, that's just the area where it's physically not possible to utilize the water. There's also a certain amount of the water that's already dedicated to uh, fish purposes and other environmental purposes. And then there's water dedicated to um, water accounts for downstream users. And so the actual remaining is quite a bit less than the total would suggest. Water districts will begin taking a 55% cutback and without significant rain this winter, then in the following year, that'll be very much less. If the drought continues and the lake level drops below 30%, adjustments will need to be made in order to access the remaining water. We've calculated that the lake level will be uh, to a point at which it can no longer reach the south coast via gravity, which is how it's designed to flow. And we've calculated that that will occur sometime toward the end of September. And as a result, uh, the, the Kachuma Operations and Maintenance Board is conducting a construction project to um, basically put a barge in the lake that will pump water up and into the outlet work so that um, we can continue to get take water after um, after it reaches that critical level. Without as much water coming from Kachuma, the South County will have to rely more heavily on the use of groundwater. In general, uh, groundwater is extremely important because, for one, there's no evaporation from a groundwater basin 
but also it kind of supplies the, the last line of defense in a drought. You can always turn to groundwater supplies as long as they haven't been overutilized over a long period for additional supply. Another major resource being used by the entire county is state water. Well, Kachuma plays a role as a conveyance facility for the South Coast for the state water project. The North County purveyors that do get state water uh, take that water as the pipeline makes its way down from Northern California and through San Luis Obispo, enters the county at Santa Maria. Santa Maria and Guadalupe each take water off the pipe, goes down Vandenberg Air Force Base, gets a lot of water from the state water project, and then onward to uh, the cities of Buellton, Solvang, and then San Inez Improvement District 1. It all comes down the same pipeline. They've all paid for their share of the sizing of that pipeline to get their proportionate share of the water. And so they actually take their share of state water before it even gets to Lake Kachuma. So state water is really currently critical because of, of how tight our water supplies are. And right now behind me, you can see the pipeline where state water is coming into the reservoir. And it, and it appears to be very little. And in fact, it, it is by some measurements. It's, uh, it's about 46 acre feet per day, which is all that the capacity can handle. But for a comparison, evaporation, you know, from the lake on an average day can be easily be half that, um, sometimes more. So um, it's really critical, and and that's why CCWA is looking for additional um, purchases beyond what is is normally got through the state water water project because that as you know, has been reduced to 5% this year. Many districts throughout the county are also beginning to pursue purchasing water. Some districts have opted to purchase additional water, and so they are getting additional water uh, through that supplemental purchase. But in the end, anything that uh, they come up short, they will revert to their groundwater resources to make up that difference. The city's been actively pursuing the purchase of water from outside the area and so far we have made good progress on that and we feel pretty comfortable about meeting next year's water needs as long as the community can meet that 20 percent goal. It's really, I can't emphasize more how critical that 20 percent conservation goal is. I think if the community can get to that 20 percent goal, we'll be good for water for next year, which is a lot in this current drought. We are incredibly fortunate to have such a diverse water supply in Santa Barbara County. However, droughts come as no surprise to our semi-arid climate. The best thing we can do in dry times, as well as rainy times, is to conserve the water that we already have. We don't know going in the next year how much water is available. Central Coast Water Authority has done a good job of getting supplemental water for those agencies that have wanted it. Next year, if we continue with these conditions, those supplies that were purchased this, this year won't be there. And it's hard to tell what will be available or what the cost of that will be. So it's, it's very possible that additional sources would have to be brought in. Uh, but if they're not available, then conservation and the use of our groundwater basins is really the answer for the North County until things start to recover. Droughts are a normal part of, of living in the Central Coast, and we've had severe droughts before. However, this um, current drought is probably the most severe when looked at in terms of the last three years. There was 60% uh, um, of, of normal rainfall, then 40, and then I think close to 30%. So it's been extremely dry, and um, supplies have dropped off very quickly. And so conservation right now is, is extremely important for all parts of the county, but certainly on the south coast, everyone's looking uh, to people to conserve water on their landscapes and, and in their houses as, as a critical part of getting through this period until we get some substantial rainfall. I think it's really important to recognize that as a county, we're all on, for the most part, the same straw. The state water project coming down from Northern California, we're, we're utilizing the same supplies. Kachuma Lake for the South Coast and the San Inez Valley, the same supply. So to conserve those supplies will help us in the future. To find out more about where your water comes from, visit waterwisesb.org education. Now that we know where this valuable resource comes from, it's time to find out how we can conserve more of it in our landscapes. Stay tuned as water expert Kathy Perret shows us how to use a watering calculator. Hi, I'm Kathy Perret with the City of Santa Barbara's Water Conservation Program. 
Today I'm going to show you how to use the online landscape watering calculator. You can visit it at waterwisesb.org. So on the landscape watering calculator, the first step is to click on the map where your property is. We're in Santa Barbara and Goleta. So let's click there. And then it takes me to where those questions are that we checked out in your landscape. What do we want to call this? Let's call it our lawn zone. And there are different options here when it comes to type of plant. Warm season, cool season, low water using plants. Most of the grass in Santa Barbara is a warm season blend of Bermudas and different types of grasses. So we're going to stick with the warm season grass. So on step three, we need to determine what type of soil we have. So we're going to step outside and check the soil. Now we're going to check the structure of the soil. We're going to use a soil probe. We pull it out, we'll get a sample of the soil. If you pull this out, make a fist, put your thumb and you can see your thumbprint, it's clay. If you can't hold it together at all, it's sandy. Beautiful soil is called loam, probably in your vegetable garden. This particular lawn soil here makes a nice little ball, crumbles out, looks like nice soil, it's a clay loam. So that's what we're going to put on the watering calculator. We're going to select clay loam. Now let's go back out and check what kind of sprinklers we have. We need to determine what kind of sprinklers there are. That's really important because each set of sprinklers puts off a large volume or a really small volume of water. These sprinklers here, these are called pop-ups. They pop up. This particular nozzle puts off about a gallon and three quarters per minute. So we want to know that the lawn zone has pop-up sprinklers. All right, well, we have pop-up sprinklers. So we're going to take and click the pop-up sprinkler tab. And that ends all the information we need to know. So we're going to press, please create my custom watering schedule. Shows our lawn, warm season grass, clay loam soil, pop-up sprinklers. And for summertime, our highest amount of water that we would want to apply would be 30 minutes in a week. We need to determine whether we want to water it two days a week. That would be 15 minutes each day or three days a week. That'd be 10 minutes each day. 30 minutes is our max, and as the seasons change, we would adjust that time down. Well, we're going to add our second area, and we're going to call this the front yard. And we know that that's a drip zone because we were outside and we looked at it. And while we were checking our grass, we know that what we have are low water using plants, and that's one of our options. So we'll select that. We checked the soil with the soil probe and found that uh, it's also clay loam. So we mark clay loam. And then the watering system is different than we had with the lawn. That was a pop-up sprinkler system and this is a more efficient drip system. If you're not really sure which type irrigation system you have, each of these will give you more information. So this one's a drip irrigation, it explains it, and a bubbler will also explain what a bubbler is. So we're gonna click the drip and let it create our watering schedule. When we look at our watering schedule, we can see that for the front yard where it's drip, we're needing to water it on an average for the really hot months here. It looks like about 45 minutes. And we wanna decide whether we're gonna water that two days a week or one day a week. These are a little smaller, so I'm gonna water it two days a week. So I'm gonna take that 45 minutes and divide it, and on one day, I'll water it for 22 minutes, and on the next day, I'll water it for a following 22 minutes. Then I'm going to watch it and make sure that that's enough water to keep those plants healthy. Now that we've got all the information about the landscape, we know the kind of sprinklers, the kind of plants, the kind of soil, we put it into the watering calculator. It gave us value for our lawn zone, which is program or station number one of 30 minutes for our 100% or summertime watering. We don't want to apply it all at once. So we're going to go with splitting it up three times per week. So if it's 30 minutes for the week, we're going to schedule our number one station or zone for 10 minutes. You go to the station, you hit the adjust, set this for 10 minutes, and then every week, three times a week on the days that we've scheduled, it will water for only 10 minutes. So now we know we've got our 10 minutes. Let's make sure of our days. We have Monday is on, Tuesday is off, Wednesday is on, Thursday's off, Friday's on, 
Saturday and Sunday are both off. And it comes on before 8 o'clock in the morning. We'll put it back up to auto, and it's good to go. What I'm going to do after all this gets inputted, I'm going to watch it. I'm going to watch my landscape for the next couple of weeks. If the lawn zone is looking really lush and green, well then I'm giving it too much water and maybe my system is just really efficient. If we come back out and the system, everything's getting really dry, we might want to increase for one minute. Each minute on a lawn zone runs 10 gallons to 12 gallons per minute. So every minute you adjust is really fine tuning your system. But most of the time, this is gonna be a perfect little guideline for you, and then you can customize it depending on your landscape. Well, now we're moving on to scheduling our drip zone, and most of that is a more of a mature, drought-tolerant, low water using plants. And when we looked at the watering calculator, it told us we needed an average of a good 45 minutes per week. There was a high month in there, but you need to adjust that according to what your local weather is. So we're going with 45 minutes in the week. Unlike lawn, Shrubs have much deeper roots and can be watered less frequently. Depending on how mature your plant is, you may want to only water it once a week, say for a hedge. Or if you have something like rosemaries or something that's maybe knee length or lower, then twice a week usually works. So we're going to go to station number two, or zone number two, and we're going to divide that 45 minutes and we're going to water it twice a week. So on that you can't put 22 and 23, so we're going to water it for 22 minutes twice a week. I'm going to go down here at the, t the zone number two for my drip. Just like on the other one, we'll hit the adjust button, and you can hold it down so it goes a little faster, and we'll take it all the way up to 22 minutes. Put it back up on the top here so that it's at the auto, and then we'll check and schedule what days we want this one to run. So same thing, we're gonna go Monday is off, Tuesday, use the on button, it's on, Wednesday's off, Thursday's off, Friday, let's put that on, make sure there's nothing on Saturday and Sunday, go back to the go button and we are scheduled, two days a week, 22 minutes each time. So we just scheduled our controller with the information from the watering calculator and that let us set it for our 100% hot time. And as you can see, the watering needs and the plant needs change as the seasons change. In October, we only need 20 minutes per week instead of the summertime, 30 minutes per week. If you have a feature on your controller called a watering percent adjust or a seasonal adjust, you can use that as a one button change. And it changes all the times in your controller. If you want to water it for 50% of your summertime, you change that one button and every single station will be reduced to 50%. If you're interested in learning more about the watering percent adjust and that simple little one button feature, watch the video on how to do it on waterwisesb.org or on YouTube. We'll be right back with more Garden Wise. Meet the most fascinating man in the world. When droughts happen, water experts go to him for water saving actions. His front lawn requires no water because he replaced it with water-wise plants. He only works two days a week, and so do his sprinklers. He uses so little water, overwatered plants seek refuge in his yard. I know a lot about saving water, but when I want to know more, I go to waterwisesp.org. Let's save together, my friends. Welcome back. Much like water, trees are a valuable resource in our community, improving air quality and beautifying our county. But we could be at risk of losing these resources if we don't properly maintain them during the drought. Up next, arborist Karen Chrisman shows us how to properly care for our trees during dry times. Hi, I'm Karen Chrisman, and I'm a certified arborist with Arbor Services Incorporated. Today I'm here to talk to you about taking care of your landscape trees during a drought. 
So getting started, the most number one step is to find out what species your tree is and what you're dealing with so you can better plan its water needs. So number one, do you have a water-loving magnolia or do you have a native oak that needs little summer water? These are all important questions to ask. Now, if you don't know what species your trees are, you're not alone in our community. We have a diverse population of trees in Santa Barbara. Um, the number one way to find out could be the internet. There's a great book called The Trees of Santa Barbara. Number two, ask your nursery. Or number three, call an arborist. So now you've figured out what kind of tree you have and its watering needs. So what we have to look at is, again, if it's a low water tree, maybe mulch is all you need. If it's a high water demand tree, maybe it's mulch in a low volume irrigation system. One of the most important things to learn before you properly irrigate your trees during a drought is to understand how a tree's root system works and its water needs. So a tree's root system always extends to the drip line. And drip line in a borer culture is basically the edge of the canopy and sometimes beyond, depending on how far the roots move. So when you're irrigating, we want to put the water where the roots are. So with your drip irrigation, we want to irrigate that entire area, not just at the base of the tree. And that it also applies to when applying mulch. We want to apply mulch to the root zone, which again, extends to the drip line and beyond. Now in drought conditions, water is precious and it's a resource that we don't want to waste. By properly water and properly mulching, we're number one, conserving water, and number two, we're keeping the water where it needs to be in the tree's, tree's root system. So when you're working with a young tree um, in a drought tolerant program, what we want to make sure is we remember its root system probably extends to about here and maybe a little beyond. This is where we want to get our irrigation water. Out here, it's just going to be wasted. Um, number two is, a mulch application should be even and probably no more than four inches thick of organic matter. What you don't want to do is allow the mulch to build up at the base of the tree in the area we call the root crown. What we're trying to do is prevent it from decaying. So you want a little bit of space to give that area some room. Otherwise, this is a successfully mulched tree. Mulch is an important landscape addition. Not only does it inhibit weed growth, but it helps retain soil moisture. As you can see, this is a nice diverse size um, wood chip, and the different particles will break down and add nutrients to the tree in the long run. But most importantly, during a drought, it's helping to keep moisture in the ground. So the roots, rather than our atmosphere, can use that water for the tree growth. Now with new tree planting during a drought, we certainly don't want to skimp on water so that we lose our investment of the new tree. But strategic watering is critical. We don't want to overwater. Um, but signs to look for, number one, that you're not watering enough is tree dieback. In this new tree, we know we're doing all right because we see nice new growth and I don't see any branches dying back. So we know they've done a great job because we're seeing new growth. So good job with the mulch and the watering. If you don't have a drip irrigation, here's a tip in your own household that you can do. Um, when starting showers or a bath, collect that water in a bucket and use that to go ahead and pour under your tree um, and that'll help you get through the drought. All right, well now we've learned about what to do with our young and new trees. Let's move on and look at some mature species. So here we have a more mature tree and we're looking at its root system that has been mulched all the way to the drip line. This tree has been mulched with about four inches of organic matter, which is helping retain moisture in this entire root system. Um, the nice thing again with using an organic matter is it breaks down over time, therefore adding nutrients, but also helping to reduce soil compaction and keep the valuable moisture in the ground where the roots can get to it. So we've got our mulch in place, but now the big question comes, how do we know if our tree's getting enough water? Well, there's two ways to look at it. We can go below ground and take a look and certainly above ground. Above ground, when a tree's not getting enough moisture, we get signs and symptoms. Um, one of the number one symptoms is branch dieback or leaf dieback. So it's always good in your landscape trees to take a look and see what's going on above ground. So understanding if your tree is getting enough water can also be looked at below ground. What's your soil moisture content? The best way to find that out is to dig below that mulch and really feel the soil about about four to five inches below ground, if not a little bit further, and feel it. If it's moist and spongy, yes, you definitely are irrigating properly. If it's powdery dry, then it's probably time to irrigate. So when irrigating to be drought wise, remember, irrigate early in the morning or in the evening when evaporation rates are their lowest. So let's talk more about mulch. One of the keys to proper mulch application is to remember over time mulch breaks down. So if you evaluate your landscape and see bare soil areas, it's time to add more. So where are you gonna get mulch? Well, there's a lot of low cost options. First off, call an arborist. Tree care companies generate mulch on a daily basis and you can either get free loads or some delivered at a low, low cost. Or if you're looking for a more decorative product, ask your local nursery.
Another thing to think about is this isn't our first drought in Santa Barbara and it certainly won't be our last. So when investing in new trees for your property, be water wise and choose trees that are low water and adaptable to our climate. For more information on tree care, visit waterwisesb.org. One Santa Barbara business recently renovated their landscape to show that even small changes can go a long way to save water. There used to be just three plants out here. There was um, a chorus and a low mondo grass and the big pencil tree behind me is still there. And we had these rocks that you still see, but they're now in a different position. We had many clients that would come by and they'd walk through our front garden and were completely uninspired and it actually became a joke with them about, you know, you want us to spend a lot of money, but look at the garden you guys have. So although it was functional, it was not attractive. It didn't say anything about our company. So now we wanted it to be both drought tolerant and aesthetically attractive. And it has some elements in it which sort of are microcosms of what we do. I think the first impression is it's water conserving. We have the gravel and we have the succulents, but we also have some whimsy and it's sort of a contrast of the boxwood hedge is sort of a traditional element. It also works off some of the force lines of the building. And then the pots are somewhat contemporary with the acacia cousin it coming out. But the ultimate concept I think is water efficiency in this day and age. Before there were um, traditional pop-up sprinklers and they just watered the whole front strip here and now those have all been replaced with a subsurface drip. It's just laying directly on the soil underneath of our mulch beds and they save a ton of water and we don't have water running off onto the sidewalk anymore. We used to have the sprinklers running two, three, four times a week. Now it's twice and it's on for just a couple of minutes. It's very efficient. They're plant materials that are readily available. They reproduce themselves pretty easily. The aloes, the echeverias, the kalanchoes all send off pieces or branches that can be cut off and duplicated and replanted. So it's a great garden for people who, on a budget. Um, the gravel's inexpensive. We only have two irrigation drip lines, um, one for the hedge and the pots, which need a little bit more water, and then the rest or just for the succulents, and most of those we could probably abandon after about six months. This has always been sort of one of our mainstays as design, both from a water efficiency standpoint and from an aesthetic standpoint. I personally, and a lot of the landscape architects here, just love the succulent material because you get the color and the texture out of the plant itself. You could use it in mass, you can use them individually as sculptural pieces. They're perfectly adapted for our community. But what has been happening is some of our older clients with more lawn or more traditional landscapes with more water needing uh, plant material are coming back to us now and saying, you know, you need to revamp our gardens, we need to save water, and so we're getting a lot of business that way. Do you have a parkway or other area of landscape that could be more water wise? Consider replacing it with beautiful drought tolerant plants. For ideas on transforming your landscape, visit waterwisesb.org. Up next, we have another horrifying crime to solve with landscape architect and author, Billy Goodnick. The story you're about to see is true. The location of these plants has been changed to protect the innocent. This is the city, Santa Barbara, California. Some call it paradise. Mountains and ocean views, classic architecture and exotic gardens but drive down any street in any neighborhood and you'll find them there, sometimes in broad daylight. People perpetrating pointlessly pitiful pruning on peaceful plants. My name is Billy Goodnick and I run the Crimes Against Horticulture Division. Actually, there's no such thing, but wouldn't it be cool if there were? My mission is to help my community create beautiful, useful, sustainable landscapes. Plants that don't look like a bunch of UFOs, meatballs, and hockey pucks. I was working the midnight shift out of the west side when my lunchtime peanut butter, chocolate and sardine smoothie started to haunt me. I was digging through my desk for an antacid when Jane dropped off a new case file. To keep up with advances in smartphone technology, law enforcement has enacted plant code 847 version 2.0. 
using a random form generator phone app for pruning. On the day of the crime, I'm guessing the screen said meatballs and Lego blocks. There's no other way to explain this. The roots of this crime begin by putting too many large plants in too small a space. Wrong plant, wrong place again. So let's figure out how to fix this. We need a time machine. We're going to go back a few years before this was planted and realize that there's so little space, solid concrete wall behind there, that the best solution would be to select a couple of large growing vines, put them on the wall, and let them spread completely. There's a lot of vines that can easily spread 6, 10, 15 feet across, so two of them spaced in that area are going to be able to do the job. It just takes a little bit of patience. Sure, the vine doesn't grow two-dimensionally all by itself. Some of the branches are going to try to grow forward, but that's not a lot of clipping to keep them back. And eventually, the entire wall will be covered in a beautiful carpet of green. Well, another case closed. Jane got another one for the files. You know all this talk about meatballs? Want to go out and grab some lunch? Well, that does it for this episode. Remember, you are the agent of change, and together we can conserve water and create beautiful gardens that provide habitat for birds, bees, and butterflies. There are lots of resources online to help. Visit waterwisesb.org for tips or to view past episodes. If you have questions or comments about the show, you can give us a call at 564-5311. I'm your host, Becky Davis, and keep it green, Santa Barbara.